Can you hear me okay now? There we go. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to start just with a little bit of, you know, it's early in the morning and I know this is, feels a little weird, but could everyone just stand up for a second? All right, I'm going to do a little, we're going to do a little exercise. So I'm assuming that if you're standing and because you're here, you are somehow interested in, curious about, or doing service design, right? Fair enough? Okay. Um, so we're going to do a thing and I'm, I'm kind of curious at like how long people have been doing it. So um, if you are really haven't really started, you're just curious about it, or you've been doing it for less than a year, sit down, please. Okay, about half, almost half the room just just curious and getting started. If you've been doing it for let's say uh, two years or less, sit down, please. Now look around. Look around. Yeah, look around. These we, these are the veterans we're looking at. <laughs> if you've been doing it for five years or less, sit down. Okay, so we got about 10 people who've been doing it for five years or more. Let's have a hand for them, huh? Okay, thank you. Go ahead and sit down. You're the pioneers. Have any, anyone been doing it for more than 10 years? Wow. Let's have a hand. What's your name, sir? What did you call it? <laughs> Can you tell us where you work? Or? I work at the Getty Okay, fantastic. Wow, awesome. So um, maybe you should be up here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to talk today about service design and when service design meets the divided company because um, I have, my background is in uh, change. Actually, I come from an art background, but I got into change through doing helping draw visualize things and a lot of the stuff that turns out needs to be visualized is change. By the way, my company Liminal, um, it's really just me and the reason it's called Liminal is because I'm in a very liminal stage in my life right now. I really don't know what I do. <laughs> so there's a company there but it's not really, I don't, I, nobody knows what it does including me. So this is the divided company, okay? This is an organizational form that is literally as old as the pyramids, right? Hierarchical organization. Now, it's also a very industrial form of organizing. You know, you've got the CEO at the top, you have, or the board, and you have divisions and departments and silos. And really this, uh, as a management concept, this goes back to Adam Smith in the 1700s, who was talking about division of labor, right? The whole idea of a divided company is division of labor, right? Make things Take, the, take all the work, divide it up into departments and divisions, and then you can make it more efficient because everybody's doing one little thing. And because the mastermind who designed the organization put all this stuff together, everything works like a clock, right? Like a Swiss watch, except it doesn't, right? Now, each one of these departments and divisions now, you, raise your hand if you work in a company that feels like this or your customers are in companies that feel like this. Okay, so it's not an alien thought, right? This is, these are divided companies. They have, the, everything's divided, right? Budgets, jobs, departments, you have sales, you have operations, et cetera. Usually divided by function. Now, where we come in, the customer experience of working with an organization like this can be really frustrating, right? calling in, you go through the voice menu system, one for this, two for that, three for, you know, okay, none of them are right. You click the one, you, you touch the one you think is closest, and you bounce around, right? You, oh, after they've got all your information, first you have to type it in on the phone by number, then they ask you again, <laughs> then they're the wrong person, they have to send you to another person who, again, asks you for that same information all over again. It's like talking to a dysfunctional human being, right? Like someone who's like a multiple personality almost. Um, this is where we come in, right? We are the heroes for the customer. Instead of, because what's happened in this divided organization is it's been basically been designed to make everything efficient for the working of the organization, not for customers. And so customers got pissed off. I know you probably know all this. 
we got social networks. We started complaining and bitching and whining on Twitter about fail, things that fail, right? <laughs> and what happens then is we're going to cut across all this, and we're going to design this world around what's efficient for the customer, right? What the customer, what's going to be great for the customer, right? OK, so who thinks we can do this without pissing people off? Raise your hand. What? what? <laughs> We have a couple of idealists. Now, why, why did, how did we ever think we could do this without pissing people off? Every one of these silos, right? Every, we are threatening power structures. We are threatening their budgets. We are threatening the incentive and reward systems that they have, their routines, and in some cases, even jobs, right? And in some cases, jobs that have existed for maybe 50 to 20, 50, 100 years in some cases. OK, this is not a simple thing that we're doing. It's the design of it, the thinking of it. I mean, I've talked to a friend of mine who has been doing service design for about 10, 13 years or so. So he's definitely a veteran. Um, and he said, you know, the actual design of the service is relatively easy. The hard part is getting the organization to adapt to deliver the service. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I've got a tool for you that will help you kind of think about culture in a different way and sort of understand the lay of the land, sort of if you're going to, if you're, if you're going to go to war <laughs> or, you know, you want to understand the territory that you're going to be going to war in. That's what the culture map tool that I'm going to share with you is about. And I also got some tips. I went out and interviewed a bunch of people who are doing this, who've been doing it for a, a reasonably long period of time and talk to them about, what have you done? That's worked. So I've got a few just practical tips, and then we're going to end with the checklist. How does that sound? OK, checklist. And we'll share these slides with you, too. OK, so first, culture and change. This is a slide you've probably seen. You've heard this before. 70% of change initiatives fail. Um, you know, depend on who you ask. It's definitely more than half. Um, why do they fail? little change quiz. Who has the most to lose in a change initiative? Yeah, worker. I mean, basically, whoever has the most power has the most power to lose, right? <laughs> so uh, you, you, they've, uh, you know, this is the Deloitte study on uh, top barriers to implementation of any new thing. The top one is a resistance to change. So who has the most power to resist a change? Whoever has the most power, right? They have the most to lose, and they have the most power to resist. This is why so many of these change initiatives fail. So where does that power come from? A big part of where it comes from is culture. Culture is a, the way that we work together. It's the kind of the unwritten rules of the organization. And the, it's how people who have power have it and how they hold on to it. So if you want to understand the dynamics of change, I believe it's very, very important to understand the dynamics of culture. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So what is culture? Culture is the habits of a group. That's all it is. Habits form over time because certain kinds of behavior are rewarded. Anyone here ever tried to smoke or tried to quit smoking or had a friend who tried to quit smoking? You know what? That's, that's really hard, right? And it's even harder when you've got two married people or people that hang out together a lot that are both smoking or three people who are smoking and they're trying to quit together, that's even harder because everyone's going to go back to these old behaviors, even though they know they're bad for them, right? An organizational change is like 10,000 people trying to quit smoking at the same time who've all been smoking for 20 years. Even if they know it's the right thing to do, it's still really, really hard, really hard. So th the reason that these habits form is that they work. They're successful for whatever reason, they have been successful. Even smoking can be seen as a successful behavior. We know it's long-term bad for us, but it gives us a short-term good feeling. I used to smoke. I did quit. Um, people swim in culture the same way fish swim in water. It's just how we swim together. Yes, I drew these. I told you I went to art school. <laughs> Finally get to use my drawing skills. It's how we coordinate, how we avoid conflict or not, right? 
when we bump into each other. All this stuff is culture. It's kind of invisible. We don't usually talk about it, and that's part of the power of it, that we don't usually talk about it, but it's just how we work together. There's a culture even of how we got together into this room, how uh, we sort of had the, the sort of decompression zone out there with the drinks and how we slowly moved in here. All that stuff is culture. So, now, I'm going to do a grave oversimplification. I'm going to use um, funny animals to make my point here. Um, Mr. Shark and Mr. Dolphin. Um, but only to make the point of uh, what culture is and, and, and how it works, right? So sharks are hierarchical, territorial. They swim together differently than dolphins swim together. Just like carp and you know, minnows and every other sea creature, they swim together in a certain way. Uh, dolphins are collaborative, they're social. Sharks, how do they do it? Well, they display, they threaten each other, um, they have ways of displaying themselves to, to determine who's higher status. Dolphins have close contact, they whistle. They, they rub up against each other, they're, they're friendlier than sharks. Um, these are just some things I thought were hilarious. So it, it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but this is one thing sharks will do, they have a splash fight. You ever have anything like this in an organization happen? There's a, <laughs> okay, two executives are splashing over a kill. It's, who, it's disputed who owns this thing. Okay, here's another one, the hunch display. You ever see this in a workplace environment? This is like, this is, this is right before he, he takes off, when he like realizes he's met a higher power. That's what it is. And these, actually, if you want to look these up, it's a natural history online magazine, and they have a whole infographic of all these, uh, and it's called Sociable Killers, or Social Killers, I think. It's a great article. This is one called Repetitive Aerial Gaping. This is when the shark is like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and so this is what they do, okay? And so animals do it, we do it, you know, we're, we all do this stuff. We do, it's how we uh, relate. This is a way for a shark to express anguish without accidentally threatening another shark. This is how they do it, <laughs> okay? This is, tr this is real. So how do you find your way, okay, in an organization? You know, whether, it's whether you're the sharks or dolphins or walruses or whatever you are, right, how do you find your way? These are a couple of uh, researchers. One's MIT, the other one's Harvard. I forget which is which. I think Shine is Harvard, I might be wrong. Um, anyway, they had a method of research where they were actually consultants doing academic research into culture, but they were in organizations, working with organizations, helping them identify and work on the culture. And they had this approach they called exploratory inquiry. I use it as a consultant. I think it's very powerful for designers, for anyone to use. And it's simply a philosophy that says, ignorance is the outside of consultant's greatest lever to find out what's going on. Gather data, observe behavior, make recordings, and ask dumb questions. The outsider has the ability to see things because they're moving across organizations. They can see things that people who live there, especially people who've been there for a while, can't see. And Shine has this uh, a metaphor of an iceberg that I'm gonna share with you. Uh, really, it describes both of their philosophies. Um, the, the basic idea is that at the top of the uh, iceberg, above the water, is the behaviors that we see, the things that we can look at every day, the things that we can actually observe. I observe that, you know, when we get off the, when we walk by the street, there's a sign that takes us to the elevator. The ele there's a sign inside that takes us to the 15th floor. We walk out of the elevator, there's a registration desk with somebody ready to take your name and make sure that you're where you're supposed to be, et cetera. All these things are behaviors, and in most organizations, we only have language for discussing behavior. We can't discuss anything that's below the water. We just don't have language for it. We don't have a way to have conversations about, the, let, let's say, the splash display, a splash fight, or whatever. Now, if we start asking why, though, we can start to drill lower. And you know, the the reason that we act a certain way, there are levers and drivers. The formal or informal rules of the organization or the group that sort of tell you, like, we know, I knew it was going to be okay because of this conference and this culture that I had jeans on today. I know it's acceptable in this culture, <laughs> okay? Now, there are other kinds of conferences where I would never go that way because that's not the culture, right? 
if this is a financial industry conference, I would probably have a tie on right now. There are levers. Below the levers, we start to ask about why are those rules the way they are? There are values. There are things that this group, whatever the group is, could be your family, could be your team, could be a division within a larger organization. You could be the dolphin department in the shark company, right? Can happen, okay? Now, there are values. There are things that we think are important. That's why the levers are designed the way they are. The rules are the way they are, which is why we act the way we are. And then, we, then if you start to ask why do we have the values about what's important, you start to get to the assumptions about the world. Well, at Shark Co., you know, Shark Corp., we have certain values. We believe that it's kill or be killed. That's going to make you, that's how you're going to be successful in the world. Kill or be killed. Right? Dolphin Corp. may have different assumptions about how you make your way in the world. We think it's better to make friends. We're going to do better in the world. If we have, the more friends we have, the better we do. Okay? Every organization is going to have values, and beliefs beneath those values are assumptions about the way the world works and why we behave a certain way to be successful in this world. Um, these are values, and I'm just going to skip all the drama. They're Enron, okay? These are Enron values. So obviously, there's a difference between, and this is true for all of us, there's a difference between the values that are stated on the website and the values that you're actually living in the organization. And there's a difference for all of us in the values that we think drive our behavior, and if an outside consultant came in and watched you behave, they're going to come up with a different set of values than you think you have. Almost guarantee it. We are hypocritical creatures. It's just the way we are. That's the thing. You don't know, really know who you are, and you don't really know why you do the things you do, and neither do I, until we start to examine them. This is what um, this guy Argerus calls espoused theory, which is what we say we value, and the theory in use, was, which is what we can demonstrate, what someone could guess about our values from actually recording and watching our behavior. And you're going to find, in almost any organization, you're going to find those things are different. Anyone have a question about that or disagree? Want to come up on stage and strangle me? No, good. Um, so we take, in this particular approach, and I'm, get, I'm sort of introducing the tool to you, we take the values and we divide them in two. And we say there are certain values that are espoused theories that we say that what we say we do, or what we say drives our behavior, and then there are the theories in use, which is actually how we act out, the values that can be assumed from what we act out. So if you want to understand a culture, you can map it. This is, there's, this is where we get to the tool. You want to, the thing about these, these espoused values, or these what we say we do, is that they're discussable. We talk about them. The theories in use that are, are the things that are undiscussable. I'll give you an example. Um, consulting firm, okay? Um, you ask the the founder, the principal, CEO, what are the values of your company? Well, we value collaboration. We value collaboration. Uh, we we co-locate with our clients. We work very closely to, with them. If they're not, um, we don't think they're collaborative, then uh, we're not going to work with them. Oh, that's interesting. How do you decide whether a client is going to be collaborative or not? Well, I decide. <laughs> okay. This is the difference between, now, can you see how one is discussable inside the organization and the other is not? <laughs> it's really hard to have that conversation with your boss about those undiscussable things. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Now, this tool is going to help you become a better swimmer. I'm just going to share it briefly, and those who want, are in the workshop tomorrow will go in deeper. Uh, this is the group of people that I designed it with. Some people may recognize Alex Osterwalder, who designed the business model canvas. He did help me with it. Uh, basically, it's, you know, basically these four um, rows here are those four levels of the iceberg. The evidence, the behavior, the levers, the values, and the assumptions. And I'm going to take you just through one quick example, which is Nokia. So these are the values you can read on Nokia's website, right? Passion for innovation, collaboration, we value diversity, fast, flexible decision making, we're a flat networked organization, uh, respect the individual, we value people. Now, I, 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 I use Nokia as an example because this is a company that has been celebrated for its culture, and yet the world changed. The world changed, but the assumptions didn't change, which has been really a, had a terrible effect on this company, right? Now, 10 years ago, you would be reading about how great Nokia's culture is in corporate magazines and so forth. 
lots of articles about how it was a great culture. It was a great culture. So what's happened between then and today? It was a great culture for one thing. It's the world change. It's, it's not a great culture for the new world. Okay. So let's just take one. I'll show you how this map works. So we say we have passion for innovation. That's a value that we state. We have it on the website. So what's the evidence? So then we get to ask, what evidence do we have for this? What, what's, what can we look at that proves that this is what we value? Well, actually, when you look at it, we innovate. We come up with a lot of ideas, but we don't actually launch a lot of them. We have a great museum of awesome devices and ideas. A lot of them didn't actually get out in the marketplace. Oh, OK, well, what are the levers? What, what, what actually drove that? Well, we have all these, a lot of layers of approval. Um, it's kind of easy to block things. It's hard to get them moving. We have a lot of ways to, for things to be blocked within the organization. It's built in. It's part of the culture, right? OK, so what's really going on? Well, we have a passion for inventing things, but we really avoid risk. We, we really value security. We, what we really value is uh, the, uh, the talking about the ideas, not the launching the ideas, because there's a lot of risk involved in that. OK, so what are our beliefs about the world? Well, experiments cost a lot of money. Most innovations fail. We, own, we have 40% of market share, so it's better to do nothing than to do the wrong thing. We could lose a lot of money. Right? This is actually a great culture for a manufacturing company that has factories that has to make stuff that's out of metal and <laughs> electronics, it has to make it and launch it out into the world. For a software company, though, it's bad. You can't have a software company that can't launch stuff or that's like really, really risk averse about launching stuff. You will never succeed as a software company. So this is, a, this is where, can you see where creating a map like this can help you starting with evidence or starting with things that are really observable and start to dig down. So this is the tool I want to share with you. You can start with evidence. You can just start with things that you observe and start to go down. Or you can start with the values. I think it's sometimes easier just to start with the values as stated on the website. Then you look for evidence, and then you start to fill in the rest of it. And what you're looking for are the gaps. And what you're really looking to do is to get down to those assumptions at the bottom and say, are these assumptions still true? Because if we were going to start our company as a startup today, would we have those same assumptions about the world and what it takes to succeed in the world? Because as even a successful company, the world changes, right? And those assumptions that may have been true 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago may not be true, may not still be true. So that's what you really want to dig down. And then you can, once you've mapped out your culture and you've started to look at those assumptions, then you can start asking questions about the assumptions and maybe build another map of a culture that you want. OK, well, let, let, what, if this, what if our culture was actually, what if we didn't assume this about the world? The reason you have to get down to those assumptions about the world is that's what's going to help you make the decisions about what kind of a culture you need and how you need to get there. You may decide, for example, as Samsung did, you're not going to try and be a software company. You're going to stay a manufacturing company. Samsung's done very well, right, the last 10 years. Um, Samsung said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to try and create our own software platform like Nokia did. We're going to make sure you can run Microsoft on a Samsung phone. We're going to make sure you can run Android on a Samsung phone. We're going to make sure you can run anything. <laughs> they're different brands, but they're all Samsung phones. And they even, since, and they even decided, well, we're also going to sell stuff to Apple. Even though we can't run Apple on our phone, we're going to make screens for them and other stuff. Okay? Now, that's a, that's, a set, that's a company that understands its culture and had a different strategy because changing the culture was just too difficult. I think that's, something, that's another very likely outcome of a culture mapping uh, process is you can say, you know what? We're not going to try and become a software company. There, there's no way we can do it. Look at our culture. And it's a good culture. It's well, it's well embedded and it's, it, it's great. Let's be good at what we're good at. Let's figure out how we can be in this new world without trying to make a massive culture shift, which is also a legitimate thing to do. Culture works because of the things it makes undiscussable. This is good in the sense that it helps us focus without a lot of distraction on things, but it's also bad in the sense that it creates blind spots. That's why this, a tool like this can be helpful. The longer you swim in a culture, 
the more invisible it becomes. The best people to tell you about your culture are the newcomers, the newbies. Of course, they're never going to tell you, <laughs> right? They're the best people to ask about the culture, but they're just trying to learn how to swim with everybody. There's no way they're going to tell you unless you create an environment that makes it okay, that makes it safe for them to discuss these things. Well, why does everybody walk backwards here? <laughs> I'm just, I, I, ask, I can do it, but I'm just asking, right? <laughs> if, you make it, if you create a safe place for them to do that, you can learn stuff about your culture you might not even know. So if you want to understand a culture, you can map it. Um, if you want to change a culture, you're going to have to start putting some of those undiscussable things on the table, which is very difficult. Um, you want to start moving these things together because a good culture, for whatever, however you want to describe a good culture, I would say the, 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 the smaller that gap is between what we say we value and what we really value, the better. The more we can talk about those things, the better. And the better we can, the more likely we can change. So now that I've probably scared the pants off everybody, um, the easiest way to change the culture where you work is actually to change where you work. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something that is leg also legitimate. You know, if you're, you know, if you're in a situation in a company where um, you can see the writing on the wall. This change is not going to happen. This is a sinking ship. Um, you know, sometimes it is better just to get off the ship. You know, that's fair. And in this world that we live in, if you're doing service design work, it is a buyer's market. Someone this morning, I won't uh, say who, but someone was saying this morning, we can't get people. We can't. You guys are hard to find. We can't find you. We need you. Okay. So there are there are jobs out there. So if you if you're living in a shark company and you're not liking it and it's going the wrong direction, you can, there are alternatives. So now I'm going to give you some tips. These are tips from real people who are doing real service design projects just like you out there. Stuff you can do. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that service design is a political act. For most organizations, it's practically a subversive act. I hope that you can see that. Um, that means that as a service designer, you're going to have to become, to some degree, a politician. Hopefully not like the ones <laughs> we have in Washington. Um, but you know, these are the methods that you have. These are political methods, right? Persuasion, negotiation, making laws, and force. These are just what I pulled from Wikipedia. Methods of politics, OK? <laughs> right? These are all the things that you, these are the levers that you can pull. All design projects come with constraints. Service design projects have probably a lot more than you would typically find. You have all, all these organizational politics and issues. You want to ask yourself what's possible. Here are some of the people. Uh, one of them is in this room, Brandon. Um, these are some of the people that I talk to, and I ask them, what have you done in the real world you know, to make service design projects, not just to make a service design on paper, but to actually make it work, actually change the company? and transform it. What kind of stuff have you learned? And there's some great stuff in here, and I can't take credit for it, but they're great change tips. Ready? OK. Um, one, this one comes from Steve Batty, Doc Batty on Twitter. Um, you can think of a change project as a service design project and for the employees. It's a little bit of a, just a mental reframing for yourself. But I like it. You know, it's like, what services do we provide for our employees? What services are we going to provide during this change and after the change? How can we be a better service provider to all these employees? It's a little bit of a mental trick, but I think it's a really good one. Um, this is another one. You have to have some senior executives in the organization that, are, that know what you're doing, that endorse what you're doing, and when necessary, that they will make the laws and bring in the force. <laughs> I'm not talking, maybe I am talking about Star Wars. <laughs> but you need, sometimes you need force. There will be people who will just resist with all their might, and sometimes you do need that. Now, of course, we all know force is a last resort, but you need to have it. You know the quote from Al Capone? I got a lot further with a kind word and a gun than I ever did with a kind word just by itself. You want to have some executive support. That's critical. Um, this is another one. 
Find the change managers. Every organization has HR people that are, their job is change. They know how to do it. Find them. Take me to your change managers. Show me, show me where they are. The service designer is a little spaceman, by the way, because I, I think in a way we're kind of, we're, we're, we're trying to navigate a new path, new organizations, trying to figure, find our way. Um, try looking at the whole system and ask some questions about it. Who's going to be hurt by this? Who are the heroes today that, you know, they might not be heroes in this new world? Who are the people who have a lot to lose? Where's the money? Where are the budgets? Who, who is this going to hurt? When you're, when you're, you're, you know, you're doing your customer journey maps or your experience maps and you're, you're drawing these pictures, you want to be asking these questions too. You know, put a little, put a little box on your, on your template. Who will be hurt by this? Who are the heroes today? Where is the money today? Because these are all things you need to be aware of for implementation. Um, look for some qu quick wins that you can build momentum over time with. This one comes from Brandon and uh, Patrick uh, Quattlebaum. Um, what's a quick way that we can prove that this works? People like to be associated with the success, right? If you can have a small success and you can go around talking about, look what we did, right? It's going to be harder for people to say, well, I don't think that's a good idea or that's not going to work and you're not going to get any money from me. And it becomes easier for them to be on the winning team with you, right? You have a quick win, you have a couple of those, you start to build some momentum. You don't try necessarily try and eat the elephant all at one time. You know how to eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. Um, how can you make this real for people? Try to show some business impact. This comes from the Adaptive Path guys, and I think it's a very, very good way to get some things rolling for yourself. Um, can you make a picture of it? If you can't actually do it, can you at least make a picture of it, make it tangible? Draw a picture of a service in your interaction or several. What's possible? Because what people are clinging to, partly the reason they're clinging to the old way is that they can't necessarily imagine what it might be like differently, how they are going to fit in this new world. Can you draw a picture of it? This, is, this also came from uh, Brandon, I think. Um, understand the cadence of the organization. Budgets. When are the budgets set? How long do they go for? If the budgets are set in January and you have an entire year, right? Or did it come from you, Patrick? <laughs> Patrick's in the room, too. <laughs> um, if you have a whole year, and you know, I think you, I think you might have bumped, you had this on a project, right? It's like, well, we'd love to have money for that, but it was set in January, and it's not till next January we're going to ever get some more. And there's these big chunks being spent on things that really are not, we don't really want to spend it on that anymore, but that's how it was set up. So you got to understand how, how these things, there's a cadence in every organization for these things. There's a timing for stuff. Figure out the timing, and the, that, you know, the earlier you can figure that out, the better. Right? Then you can get on that panel and get, get some of that budget money and so forth. And then you have a year, right? Here's another one. Put the facts on the table. You know what? Your revenue is going to go down. You know what? Your call center reps are going to have an extra minute on the phone. And I know you measure them on how fast they can get off the phone. In this project, they're going to be on there longer. Everybody knows, <laughs> okay? You're not, going to tell, you're not telling anybody something they don't know. They know. But if you don't put it on the table, they can't, you can't have the conversation about it. So these are uncomfortable things, but you've got to put them out there. And it's uncomfortable even to raise it, right? Um, you know, surface those conflicts and talk about them. This one, this came from a real life experience that I, someone shared with me. You know, you got two people in the room. I may be stating the obvious here, but your incentives are totally in conflict. You're rewarded for stuff that she is punished for and vice versa. Yeah, thank you for saying that, <laughs> right? Yes, you have to put that stuff on the table. Otherwise, people are expressing that stuff in passive aggressive ways, right? So someone's sitting there thinking, you know what, my people are all going to lose their job. And if you don't bring that and put that out on the table, they're going to say, well, I'm going to protect them. Nobody's thinking about me. Nobody cares about us. I'm going to protect my people. I don't care what they say. I don't care what's good for the world or the company. I'm protecting my people, right? 
if you don't put it on the table, then you can't have that conversation with them. You have to put it out there, even though it's like, yeah, <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> yeah, you, you, maybe you might lose some of your people. Let's talk about that. You know, you got to get people to talk about those concerns. Well, I'm worried. Some of my people are going to lose their jobs. Let's talk about that. What can we do? And this is the thing. Get them to participate in solving the problems, and then do what you can. Get them to engage with you about the problem. I mean, they know that the, the, they know that the world is probably going in a certain way, that in some ways resistance might be futile, right? They have some, at some level, they're thinking that. Give them a way out. Give them a window that you can talk about it. Give them some space. What can we do about that? Well, I guess a lot of my people could do these new jobs if they had a little bit of training. Maybe not everybody, but some of them. Maybe quite a few of them could. Or, you know, show me where there could be jobs for them in the organization. Help me. Make it as good for them as you can. But you can't do that without engaging with them and having the conversation. What can we do? This is a reality. This is happening. What can we do about it? Sometimes they're failures. Failing is part of the learning process, right? Also, it can be a way to expose gaps in the organization, in the silos. So you bring those gaps. You, oh, guess, guess what? Look what we found. We dropped some balls here. What did we learn? It can be a good chance to bring people together, right? Wow, you know what? We didn't even think about it. There's this whole department over here as part of this equation. We didn't even think about them. We missed them completely. We need to bring them in. They need to be getting into this uh, situation. They need to be in the table with us. Um, this is the last one. This is probably the number one thing that I heard from every service designer that I talked to. You got to be kind of choosy about the projects you take on because that 70% of failure of change initiative number is pretty real. Whether it's 70 or 50 or 60 is pretty real. And you don't want to hook up your heart and soul and energy in a year or two of your life in a project that's doomed. <laughs> Excuse me. You just don't. You know. <laughs> A lot, you know, you, uh, I was saying in the, the lobby before we came in here, you don't want to be the bad news bears going up against the Dodgers. It's just not a game you want to play, okay? And uh, so we, I have a check. This is where we're gonna, about to get to the checklist, which is kind of like some thing, a checklist of things that you can kind of go through to make sure that your project is aligned with success, okay? Here it is. So are there powerful interests against it? Are there big sharks, big powerful interests that can, that have, that are against this happening at all? Do they, the company, the people that you're talking to, do they really want to do this? Do they understand what it's going to take? Are they ready for a one, two, three, five year initiative? Are they ready for this? Are they ready to take those big risks? Are they ready to take on the big obstacles? Do they, are incentives on the table? Uh, is, it, is changing the org structure, is that on the table as, a, as an option? These are questions to ask before you start, right? Do you have executive support? Do you have at least a VP or higher, ideally the CEO? Do you have executive, you know, powerful people who are in favor, who are aligned, who want this to happen, who are willing to put themselves at risk, put themselves on the line to make this happen? Will key individuals make the time for you? especially those people who might be against initially. And, and uh, this, I think, came from Patrick. Not, our, not an hour here and there, <laughs> but serious time, coming into a workshop. And if you, I think it was you that said, if you can't get 12 senior executives together for half a day to work on something, that's a big warning sign. <laughs> that's a big indicator right there, right, that it's not a priority or that there is something you don't know. Uh, one of the people I talked to told me, this was a really sort of an aside, but a funny story. They did a service design pilot project, research, did all the research and stuff. They had the guy who hired them. He kept going around the organization trying to get people interested in this project. They had it all ready to go. He kept going around trying to get people interested in it and uh, couldn't sell it. He got so frustrated, he quit. Two days later, the design, service design firm gets a call. They want to go forward with it. 
They just didn't like that guy. <laughs> they liked the, everyone liked it. They didn't like the guy. <laughs> they didn't want him to have the win. Okay? They just let him get frustrated and leave. Then they went ahead with it. This is the kind of stuff you can't always know as a designer what's going on. <laughs> you can't always know. If your champion is hated in the organization, that's, that's a problem, right? So if key individuals will make time for you, if you can get 12 of those people in a room for half a day, that's a really good sign. It's a sign that people are on board with it. They don't hate the guy, right? Uh, uh, lastly, do you have access to frontline? Can you get out there with customers? Can you actually prototype stuff in real world with real customers? If you can check all these boxes off in a positive way, you probably got a good project. If you, and if you, even if you can check most of them off, at least you know what you're getting into. Now, some of you work in organizations that um, maybe you already see the writing on the wall. You're kind of mentally going through this checklist going, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> Okay, well, if that is you, um, you know, the world, life's too short for you to stay in, a, in that situation, and the market is too um, hungry for good service design people for you to stay. Just, you know, think about it. Think about, think about your, you know, what, all, what your other alternatives would be. Don't be the um, person who's sort of stuck and trapped in that job that you feel powerless and helpless in. Move on. Don't be the bad news bears playing the Dodgers that's like one of Dante's circles in hell, I think. Just don't get out of that game. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I have a couple confessions after that talk. Uh, one, I worked at Nokia. <laughs> And uh, I, I think I did see the writing on the wall, and uh, I, I, did, I did change my culture by, by leaving, because uh, I saw exactly what you saw, is that, uh, hey, we're not very good at making software, and this is the direction that we're going, and we're not, we're not doing a good job with that. But, uh, so, so thanks for bringing that back and making me feel validated with my decision <laughs> to, to go to Adaptive Path. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>